Okay, good evening and welcome to Evening at Egan. My name is Tom Thornton and I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences here at UAS. And I welcome you to our last talk in this lecture series, which is an annual fall lecture series that we normally hold in our Egan Library on the homelands of the Aquan. But uh, this year it's been virtual. So uh, that's been a blessing for us and that we've been able to, to host live people from all over the country. And tonight's presentation is no exception. Uh, although the focus is a very local one, Juneau, Alaska during COVID-19, uh, we have a panel uh, of experts who's been researching this topic very recently, uh, led by our own Jim Powell. Uh, so the format tonight will be, I'll introduce Jim and then he'll introduce the panel and, uh, and orchestrate and choreograph from there. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jim Powell, who's been a member of our faculty uh, for many years. I think he joined as a term faculty member in 2013 with the, with the uh, Master's in Public Administration program. And then quite recently trans transitioned into uh, a research professorship. And that's a very rare, rare transition because he was a, uh, a bi what we call a bipartite faculty member, meaning without a research component, but was kind of carrying on research on the side. And a lot of that research was oriented towards uh, topics of the day around sustainability, uh, environment, and natural resources, and now COVID. Uh, and all of these things have in common that they require some kind of adaptive governance because they represent uh, changes in the environment that we have to respond to with our local, regional, state, uh, national, and international governments. And so uh, this project is one that Jim uh, initiated uh, or was initiated with his partners with NSF as part of their rapid response uh, research program for COVID-19. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jim and uh, let him introduce the rest of the program. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction and good evening. And uh, I'm really excited about this evening. Uh, we have some initial findings about uh, the response and also impacts of COVID-19 on Juno. Um, advance, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, as Tom said, we're on the ancestral lands of uh, the, the natives here, and I won't uh, go over that again, but thank you very much. Gunish Chish, thank you. And I'd also like to thank all the people that got involved in this project. We had over, uh, oh, um, 100 people that were uh, interviewed in some way or surveyed. So uh, thank you to all of them and to the city and borough of Juneau and their time. And uh, it's very special during this time because they are pushed with uh, dealing with COVID-19. So thanks again, Gunas Chish. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, some ground rules, uh, just in probably many of you have heard these before, but uh, if you have questions, we'd like to hold those until the end. And uh, one of our, uh, our graduate research assistant, Peggy Wilcox will be uh, navigating those questions as uh, you put them into the chat and we might have time for verbal but uh, for right now let's if you have questions put them in the chat and then we'll field those with the different research uh, professors that we have. Uh, just as introduction we have four university centers that have been involved in this uh, research project and I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for funding this project and these are some of the logos of the programs that are involved. Next. Research team, uh, we've got um, political scientist Bob Orton, who's a political science research professor at George Washington University, and then uh, an indigenous scholar from University of, uh, up at Fairbanks, uh, Sean Islick uh, Topcock uh, from the School of Education and Indigenous Studies, and then economist Joe Little, who used to be at UAF and now is at the uh, uh, Northern Arizona University and is still associated with UAF at, at the International Arctic Research Center. And we're really glad to have uh, Dr. 
Hana, um, Axel Rod, because uh, she's busy in, uh, because she's an infectious disease uh, professor. Uh, so we're really hap happy to have, she's also from George Washington University. And Peggy Wilcox, who's a graduate research assistant in the program that I teach in, the MPA program. She's a candidate here at UAS. Next. So the question, the research question is, how is Juno responding to COVID-19? To look into that and to study it, we, we've taken three, at least three different methods, individual interviews, and we were uh, fortunate to be able to interview all of the um, decision makers at the city hall. All the assembly members were interviewed, the mayor, uh, the city manager, uh, deputy uh, city manager, and then a lot of experts. And we had about 61 uh, interviews there. Uh, and then also we did a survey of the neighborhood associations. Uh, we got 56 interviews done, or I'm sorry, 56 responses to the survey. And then currently there's a, we've collaborated in a couple different ways with different people in town. Do you know Economic Development Corp uh, Council and also the Sitka Sound uh, Science Center, which is currently doing a, the second phase of a survey. It's an attitude, attitudinal survey. It's a community survey and they're surveying the different communities in Southeast, including Juneau. And that's underway and we have a link to that at the end of our, at the end of our presentation if you'd like to and we'd love to have you guys participate in that also. That's a community survey. So from this, we've gathered uh, a lot of information, these different methods. Next. So we're gonna try something, I don't know if it's new or not, but we'd like to uh, uh, show you some excerpts. Uh, Pat Race, who will introduce him. Here we go. Uh, so the, uh, we're gonna show you some excerpts from interviews. So uh, let's, Try to uh, merge that into the presentation if we can, Peggy. Hi, my name is Pat Race and I'm a filmmaker and illustrator. I live here in Juneau and I'm working on a companion uh, film project. It will be a short film that is tied into this research uh, and into themes of resilience and what it means to be living in this time and place and during this pandemic. Um, what I'm gonna share tonight uh, are kind of the seeds uh, that are laying the groundwork for that film. Um, these are excerpts from the interviews that the research team did. Um, the first clip will be a selection of audio excerpts from Vivian Mork, who is a local small business owner, an indigenous woman. Uh, she has medical expertise. She knows a lot about uh, the land and the um, and gathering here in Juneau and uh, Southeast Alaska. And she just has a really wonderful, I think, uh, historical context. Um, and she's done a lot of her own research and uh, is, is just a a bright, friendly, wonderful human being to boot. So I'm very happy to share some of her words tonight. Um, and then uh, the second clip, which we'll play a little bit later in the program, uh, features Rory Watt, who is our city manager. Um, he is uh, very candid and I appreciate that. And he's um, he pull, kind of pulls back the curtain a little bit on what it means to be managing a city through this kind of slow rolling crisis. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to play those audio clips with a little bit of um, just some photos I've taken this summer um, to kind of set the, the mood of the time and the place that we're in. Um, and if you have questions about the film project or um, if you have uh, kind of your own photos of this time and place, I'd actually be really interested in seeing them. Um, I don't know what the final film will look like yet, but um, it might be something that I'm interested in crowdsourcing some, um, some work for. So if you have your own photos of, um, you know, maybe it's your backyard barbecue with people with masks on or, or your hikes this summer that you did outside. Um, if you have things like that, that show little slices of life of Juno, I'd love, I'd love it if you'd share them with me. Um, and you can get in contact with me through the research team. Um, or if you know me personally, just drop me a line. So um, great. Uh, enjoy the footage and thanks for being here. I see some of the larger dialogue around the pandemic happening and when we are looking at past pandemics and um, occasionally hearing people say, oh, that was a long time ago. 
And I don't know if it's because as an indigenous person, we actually don't see something that happened a couple hundred years ago, very long ago, when you have a culture that's been somewhere for more than 10,000 years. You know, when you're some of the oldest people to reside in one spot traditionally for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, something that happened a few hundred years ago is not a long time ago. So definitely something that happened only a hundred years ago is not very long ago. The 1918, uh, to 1920 uh, influenza epidemic is not a long time ago uh, in the realm of history of Alaska. Um, we look to the past to understand the present so we make better decisions for the future. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we pass down the stories that we've had for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. They can only guesstimate the numbers, uh, the huge numbers of people that uh, were killed by that epidemic. And, and here in Alaska and American Samoa, we were hit harder uh, than uh, per capita with loss of life than anywhere else in the world. Entire villages gone in one winter. Just recently, um, I came across an article for the Juno Empire from 1918 in which they were uh, mandating a mask in the community. And, uh, and here we are literally in the last couple of days uh, having another mask mandate. And uh, it's interesting because wearing a mask and keeping a physical distance and not gathering in large numbers and washing your hands has literally been protocols for dealing with a virus and a pandemic for more than 100 years. And I hope that if we get hit with a pandemic in another 100 years, we're not still having the same discussion. <laughs> so there are numerous pandemics uh, that Alaska Native people have faced over the years. Obviously, there was a lot with contact that is something that every indigenous person knows across the entire planet is uh, in the process of colonization. Uh, we were always hit with epidemics, whether that be the measles, uh, the mumps, influenza, uh, a variety of other respiratory illnesses, tuberculosis, uh, et cetera, smallpox. Um, so uh, some of the earliest epidemics that were recorded uh, start in the 1700s here in Alaska. Uh, in particular, uh, in 1791, there's a respiratory illness in the Aleutians and Kodiak Island that was fairly devastating uh, to a lot of people. And then, um, you know, there was also uh, maybe not uh, recognition or names of what specific epidemics were. Uh, there was uh, a very large fever in 1802 that hit the island of Atka. There was another respiratory illness that was brought to Kodiak in 1804 by a Boston uh, ship uh, called the O'Kane. There, um, in 1806 and 1807, there is a respiratory disease uh, in the Aleutians that killed um, it killed so many people that there wasn't enough people to bury the dead. Um, so we've got some experience with surviving uh, epidemics here in Alaska, you know, and, and also um, being hit very hard and having a lot of people not survive. And we have a lot of reasons to be cautious in Alaska. Uh, during epidemics, because uh, healthcare was definitely a lot more limited at that time. But we all know that healthcare is still limited in Alaska. We know that there are hundreds of villages in Alaska with zero clinics. Literally hundreds of villages in Alaska with zero clinics. But the virus has kind of ripped open the underbelly of society and showed us where we are failing uh, and, and how we can do better. 
the most devastating times of history for human beings are sometimes also our best times as human beings because that's when people step up and do their best to put their best foot forward. The choices we make with the gifts we are given during hard times are very, very important. All right, and I'm handing it back to the PowerPoint. Great. That was excellent. Just excellent. Uh, thank you, Pat. And we'll see more uh, later in the presentation. Uh, to move forward, um, back to the data seems uh, um, pretty plain compared to that video. Um, this is how we uh, went about gathering information. Uh, we wanted to gain information from local experts, local knowledge holders, so we had interviews. And this is kind of the percentage of the interviews, how it, how it broke out. We couldn't do everything. It's a limited funding. So we went to government. Uh, we had uh, quite a few, most of our interviews there. We focused on some of the economics, which we're going to go over this evening, and also the healthcare system, interviewed people at the hospital, and indigenous people. Next. Okay, so it, this presentation is going to focus on five different areas. I'm going to talk about adaptive governance, um, and then uh, each of the researchers will, will take an area. I'll do adaptive governance, uh, and then communications, Alaska Native response, economy and policy response, and then healthcare. Next. So, adaptive governance. Um, in short, uh, we found that Juno uh, really responded in adaptive ways and, and has been doing that for quite a while. And I'd like to focus on three different uh, findings or early findings, you might say, that lead us to that conclusion. First, there was early action, which took some risks and leadership. Uh, the organizational structure, um, I think, had something to do with it too. And then lastly, shared you know, or what we would call integrated leadership. Next. This is a um, timeline for March, and it shows different actions taken by government. And uh, if you look at March 22nd, that's when we did a honkering down uh, 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 mandate. And uh, that's when we really started. There were other things that preceded that. Um, it wasn't until almost a week later that the state decided to do it. So we were out front as a local government. That's one indicator of early leadership and taking risks, quite frankly. Uh, next. And this is a more up-to-date and longer timeline to almost up to today. You'll notice that uh, the local government took many actions and they tried to um, head off the, uh, this, you know, trying to uh, cut down the, the, the slope um, of the uh, reported cases. And I think they were relatively um, uh, successful. If you look at the bottom of the screen, that's, those are positivity rates and Juno actually has done better uh, than the other uh, communities in Alaska. Uh, technically. Next. Uh, going to uh, organizational structures. In 1970, uh, Juno incorporated, and at that time, uh, they could have uh, had a uh, less control than what they have right now. They have what's called home rule. That's the highest level of authority and responsibility under the state constitution that you can have for local government. They took that on. Additionally, and this evolved over time, they decided to own their own hospital, own their own airport, their harbors. Uh, by doing that, uh, you don't have to go to another government like uh, Fairbanks, uh, the state owns its own airport. So in times of crisis, it's very efficient. 
that we own those facilities. And the city manager can call and say, hey, uh, we need to do this. We need these services right away. So that is a very efficient organizational structure in times of need. Next. And then lastly, just touch on this. Uh, we think that the um, uh, CBJ showed a lot of leadership. It was really interesting. And you'll hear a little about this from Rory in the interview. Uh, when they declared uh, emergency, there was an emergency declaration made, they gave a lot of authority to the city manager. But the city manager basically put it back on the assembly and said, no, I need you to strongly be involved in the decision making. Let's do this together. So they had many, many meetings. Um, so that was an indicator of, of shared leadership, as well as uh, the thing that the city manager did was to right away uh, delegate all the responsibility for the unified command, the emergency operations center, uh, which is a very typical um, organizational response in times of crisis. But in our, in, in our community, it, it translated into three different units, the hospital because of the nature of the crisis, public health and the city, that was the unified command. And the head of the unified command he gave to the deputy city manager. Um, and that's who you see in the, in the picture. Next. And finishing up the adaptive governance, um, we found out that not only do we think that, but the public thinks that the local government was prepared and taking the right actions. The, these are some initial survey responses of the general public. And I don't know how well you can see this, but um, that question was, how do you feel about local government and is it prepared and taking the right actions? The gray, and this, those are age groups, the gray is their response saying certainly, and uh, the orangish is to some extent and blue is not at all. So you can see that that predominantly, uh, overwhelmingly, the people think that local government is responding and taking the right actions. That in comparison to state government on the left lower, you see all the blue bars and then federal government, you see a lot more blue bars. So that's the kind of response that, um, that, that we're seeing in surveys. Uh, next. Now turning, I'll turn this over to uh, Dr. Bob Orton for communications. Thank you very much, Jim. So uh, next slide, please. So what I'd like to focus on is how uh, uh, CBJ communicated during the COVID crisis. And what's interesting is that from the very beginning, they saw the pandemic as really a communications crisis. And so they increased the staff level from a half uh, person working on communications in normal times up to eight individuals working on these issues uh, during the pandemic, often taking you know people from the library and other services that closed down to focus them on communications. And they put out posters like these, uh, which you could see around town. And then uh, next slide, um, th there's been some daily daily reports by the mayor, which are still uh, still coming out. And then also a uh, next slide. Um, now weekly updates from the city manager, Rory Watt. And he, of course, at the beginning of the crisis, he had been on the radio every morning. And in our research, we found that that was one of the most effective ways for uh, city and borough officials to communicate with the population. Many people found those 10 minute um, uh, presentations early in the morning very helpful uh, to just to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, next slide. And then, and then uh, another way that the CBJ was communicating was through uh, online dashboard. And so you'll see here's the original version. And then if you go to the next slide and then the, the next slide, so two, two more, we'll see sort of the evolution of the dashboard. And so now it's, it's a little more um, compact and, and gives you, you know, the information you need. You can tell uh, what, what the current alert level is and and uh, basic information on the new cases. And so probably most citizens in Juneau don't go 
to this uh, dashboard every day, but it's good to know it's there. And it is used quite um, regularly by city officials to, in, in making uh, decisions. Uh, so next slide. And what we see here is the results of one of the surveys um, done in Sitka by the Sitka, Science, uh, Sitka Sound Science Center and showing what kind of information people use in Juno. And so what's interesting here is obviously the, the most uh, clear uh, result of this survey is that people use all kinds of information. There's no one source that people are relying on. But if you look over on the right hand side, you'll see that one of the main sources that people do use is the local government. And, um, but also uh, there's a, a wide variety of other sources and people are often talking with their friends and neighbors. Uh, so let me go and so, you know, local AM radio is not so popular, but FM radio is up there, uh, some television, but it's probably mostly the local government and then friends and neighbors, internet sources, that kind of thing. Uh, so next slide. So, so that uh, that sort of sources of information really fits in um, with uh, what we see in general. So um, there's been a lot of research on how people get their information and how they understand their information. So clearly you have the vertical lines of information where people are getting the data from the city and borough of Juneau, as we saw, but then that information is mediated by how they see it, uh, how their neighbors see it, what people are saying on Facebook and Twitter, other online sources. So um, it's very difficult these days for the, for the authorities to communicate directly to the people without having this mediation. So I think one of the things that was um, important in Juno that helped provide a, a good response, at least in the first part of the crisis, was um, a strong community and a, a strong unified sense of value. So, you know, what you were hearing from the authorities probably wasn't that different from what you were hearing from your neighbors and, and people online. So that, that was probably effective in, in helping people deal with the crisis. And so one last slide, so next slide. And what we see in this one is sort of uh, another survey result was, you know, do you feel like you have sufficient information to prepare yourself for COVID-19? And here about 75% of the people say yes, they feel their information sources are, are sufficient and, you know, about 24% or so think that, you know, they're, they're generally pretty good and it's only 1% that doesn't feel um, that way. So probably at least at, in Juno at the local level, people felt like they had the information they need, they needed during, during the crisis. So next slide. So now I'll pass it off to us. Right, so I guess this is me. Um, okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, so I had the privilege of interviewing the, the um, Clinkett and Haida people um, uh, in the Juno area. Um, uh, I would want to um, state that, uh, oh yeah, I need to start my timer. Uh, that uh, the um, uh, native organizations, they responded very, very quickly. And um, so uh, with the Clinkett Haida um, Central Council, um, they uh, organized uh, uh, an emergency response team. And um, uh, Jason Wilson was uh, one of the main people that it helped initiated it. And they developed the emergency response team, um, you know, uh, so that they could not only address the, uh, the COVID, but also future uh, emergencies that were uh, that may potentially come on. Um, well, with the State Alaska Native Corporation, they s immediately set aside a million dollars um, to help out the frontline workers. Um, when I join up, uh, you know, all of the interviews they all centered around um, what um, uh, what uh, you saw in the video with with uh, 
that um, Pat had put together with Vivian Mork in that basically um, uh, what uh, David, the late David Katzik had, sh had shared um, uh, where um, uh, uh, say, uh, he, he, uh, you know, I interviewed him and, you know, sent this, it sent the interview. He says that uh, Klingit resiliency has survived past, pand past pandemics, including governmental institutions, various viruses, floods, mm -hmm. ice age, great earthquakes, famine and wars, etc. How they survived was utilizing Klingit language, stories, knowledge, and to live their heritage every day. Uh, uh, each, each one of the people that uh, uh, and again, this is all centered around the Southeast tribal values that they've uh, adopted, um, where they're that uh, part of their the, the feast each other up. The uh, and, uh, have pits. We talk for nature and property. Uh, the uh, there's and um, looking past. Uh, I think we lost uh, Sean, but here we go. I'm back and I've been automatically muted. I, I'm gonna go ahead and go on. Uh, everyone said that um, uh, masks are important. They're really focused on uh, not themselves, but um, their needs basically. And so, um, and everything, uh, and the, some of the uh, participants were um, elders like uh, David Katzik, um, who, uh, who who walked into the forest um, just a couple months ago, and it included also uh, uh, the youth. So we had youth ambassadors that uh, are interviewed as well, but um, uh, all of them, you know like Roberta James, she's a Clinket social worker and um, how they uh, go through um, all the other um, past um, pandemics um, is just like the way that it used to a long time ago. And we're all helping one another. And um, uh, I know Chief Marie Smith Jones, she was the last um, native EX speaker who walked in the woods in 2008. Uh, her message to me to spread to everybody else was stop the hate and just love. And that was one of the things that the, um, uh, the indigenous uh, people in, in, that are interviewed, they, you know, they is just to move forward with love in order to uh, uh, go through this pandemic. And uh, so that, you know, is, is, is opposed to, and just to work together to uh, be resilient. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Little uh, to talk about the economics. Yeah, you're, you're muted, Joe. Thank you uh, very much, Asiklik. Um, uh, I was excited to be a part of this project, um, and I've really appreciated getting to know the folks around Juno, and I just wanted to express my gratitude for all the uh, help that's been provided. Um, largely, the economic story is still being written, and while I am somewhat loath to say it, I think our challenges are just starting. Um, we don't know what the future is going to hold because this is going to change how businesses approach and structure their business uh, for tourism in particular with respect to Juno and what's going to happen in 2021 and 2022 as we move forward. So um, much of this research is obviously gonna have to continue. Um, next slide, please.
Um, much of the story, at least from a policy front, uh, we saw the adaptive response that Jim laid out, but we also saw a response at the federal level, and that came in the form of the CARES Act. Uh, the CBJ received approximately $53 million as a portion of uh, that expenditure from the federal government. Um, this is just a limited list of uh, the types of activities that were supported and areas that were supported, including housing assistance, education, uh, business granting support, transportation, uh, and food security, particularly the soup kitchen. Um, now, with that said, uh, those funds are also helping operations in the CBJ itself. And so as we move forward and those funds start to run out, there's going to be a large question that we're looking at with respect to how uh, the CBJ is going to continue to respond uh, without knowing what's going to happen in a potential future uh, support payment coming from the federal government. Now, from a tourism standpoint, uh, 2019 uh, was a particularly strong year. And you were looking at over a million visitors at 1.4 million visitors. You already know about the passenger fees and the importance that those uh, provide in terms of revenues, but also sales tax, which helps support the CBJ. And so you're looking at substantial reductions in both sales tax revenue. And I'd like to tell Jeff Rogers, thank you uh, for providing that information, but uh, sales tax revenue reductions um, that are gonna be impactful on the borough uh, years down the road. Next slide, please. Um, this data was taken from uh, uh, the CBJ's most recent sales tax revenue report. Uh, period of time for fiscal years 21, 20, uh, the quarters in uh, fiscal year 21 are forecasted. Now we've already gone through quarter one and quarter two, or in the middle of quarter two, sorry, for uh, fiscal year 21. But obviously the peak in uh, 19 would match up to quarter one for fiscal year 20, looking at sales tax revenues of 17.1 million. Um, those came in at this most recent fiscal year at 9.4 million. And so that reduction is pretty substantial, particularly when you look at sales taxes being an important source of revenue for the CBJ. Forecasting out beyond uh, FY21, um, they're anticipating uh, continued, although a small increase, but a continued um, level of sales tax revenues that aren't going to be commensurate with what you've seen in, uh, in 19 and 18. And so they're anticipating uh, revenue shortfalls for at least the next few years. So that can be uh, substantial, at least from the standpoint of providing uh, support for salaries, obviously maintaining employment, but also uh, borough services as well. Next slide. Now, uh, the JEDC, and, and, and I want to express my gratitude for these numbers as well, uh, actually conducted a really great survey of local businesses. This is probably one of the best pieces of information that has been produced, I would argue, by the CB, uh, by an entity in the CBJ when you look at getting some on the, on the ground uh, data from actual businesses. And so uh, just some snippets, and I would encourage all of you to go to the JEDC website and read the actual report and look at the PowerPoint that's available. But um, there were about 250 businesses that responded. A mix of sectors was represented. Uh, they provided full and part-time employment. And so you have a good cross-section of the business community in Juneau. And looking at these impacts, it's kind of some stark numbers um, based on 2019 and 2020, uh, the difference in full-time employment, which was reported by these businesses, is pretty substantial. Uh, 2319 and 2019, and falling to 949, this most recent year, uh, for part-time employment, which would be much higher given the seasonal nature of tourism, uh, around 5,000 individuals, and that was reported at close to 700. So there's been a substantial reduction in employment. Now, if you were to look at state unemployment figures, what's really interesting is if you track the normals unemployment trends in the summer that should be lower in Juneau. This year, they were closer to 10%. They're currently at 4.6%. But if you use that calculation with respect to the number of reported unemployed, there's actually been a reduction in the labor force of about 300 people uh, in the CBJ this year in the most recent report. So there's been a good reduction in unemployment. I would argue, but we really don't know what this trend is going to look like in the future, depending on how the tourism industry recovers um, moving forward. Now, other pieces of information that were very interesting in the survey, um, what was kind of stark is that 58% of the respondents 
uh, indicated that they'd be able to continue business um, less than a year if the pandemic continues at this rate. Now, fortunately, it looks like on our horizon that the vaccines hopefully will be successful and bring this to a close. But many businesses were facing a, a tough year and they were likely to go under based upon this type of data. Uh, secondarily too, uh, approximately 58% of the responding firms indicated that they received uh, paycheck protection or participated in paycheck protection uh, through the CARES Act, which is a substantial number of the businesses in the local communities. So if you look at the CARES Act and its role in trying to buy time for businesses, it does look like that was utilized by local business. Uh, the government was successful in trying to support the dissemination of funds through a variety of grant programs. Um, but just the same, the economic consequences have been significant and they could potentially remain so as you move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Some of those continued challenges we highlighted and again, drawing on uh, budget reporting provided by the CBJ, um, you know, the forecasted note indicates that there was a reduction between fiscal year 2019 and for forecast 2021 of 20. 12.8 million, and that's a pretty stark reduction in sales tax revenue for the borough. Um, now, other issues that pop up then when you look at this is how to contend with those budget reductions. And this is just a small list um, of potential budget reductions that have been highlighted by the borough. Um, approximately $2.1 million in cuts have been identified potentially. Um, where those will go will obviously be up, uh, up to the assembly, but you're looking at the temporary closing of the aquatic center. Um, not filling uh, positions and reorganizing the borough workforce in this context. And so um, there have been a lot of responses from the economic front to try to mitigate and minimize some of the impacts, but the impacts, as I've said, have been quite stark. Um, as we move forward, there's gonna be challenges uh, for policymakers and decision makers and planners in the community to contend with. And so I think uh, Sean hit a key point and working together is gonna be one of those key elements and really trying to support that economic recovery and development over the next few years. And that's uh, my end. I'm gonna hand this off to Dr. Axelrod who's gonna talk about uh, the medical perspectives. And you can just skip that, sorry, Sean. Thank you very much, Joe, and um, thank you, uh, Jim and Bob and Sean and uh, Joe for inviting me to be part of your research team. Thank you so much uh, also to Peggy, uh, who has been an absolute force of nature and organizing all the interview schedules, transcripts, and survey information. Uh, this was tremendous work behind the scenes that really made it possible for, uh, for, for me to do this work remotely. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much uh, also for the kind photographer who pro provided some of the images uh, as much as I would have loved to personally have walked around with a camera. It's a little, little different uh, from across the country. So the, uh, the background for the uh, healthcare response in Juno is uh, just to uh, outline a little bit the structures and the facilities that existed at the beginning. So Bartlett Regional Hospital is not only the uh, medical center for Juno, it is also the uh, hospital that provides access to higher level medical care and serves as a gateway for surrounding towns, villages, and the, the wide uh, network of clinics of search around it. Bartlett uh, includes uh, about a 50 bed capacity, uh, about 30 uh, full-time physicians, an ER and an ICU. Uh, it is owned by the city, which is a bit of an unusual uh, arrangement for US hospitals, but which might have actually uh, worked in its favor during this pandemic response because it's made it easier for communication and alignment of operations between what the city, the Department of Public Health and the hospital were doing. The hospital, uh, went into the spring of 2020, uh, according to the interviews we did, in uh, relatively good pre-pandemic shape in terms of staffing resources, operations, and finances. However, uh, it faced a challenge with very quickly needing to institute completely new isolation and safety protocols in order to be able to operate safely during the pandemic. Other facilities that, uh, other physical facilities that become important in this response 
are the airport, uh, where, uh, which was also controlled by CBJ, uh, where you uh, would screen and uh, then be able to track visitors and uh, incoming people. The uh, Convention and Performing Arts Center, uh, so this is, uh, this is Centennial uh, Hall Performing Arts Center, which was converted uh, to a quarantine and uh, testing area. And there were also public spaces that were standing unused when public gatherings were shut down. Uh, and they were converted to kind of temporary shelters for uh, people who were homeless, who were COVID positive, so that they could isolate from the rest of the uh, undomiciled population and help control the outbreak among the uh, people who don't have permanent housing. The uh, community partners, which are not under control of, the, of CBJ directly, but were incredibly important in this, uh, have been SEARCH uh, with its network of clinics and its own resources for testing and uh, for patient management, and the long-term care facilities, uh, which really uh, had to uh, stand up uh, an organized and intensive response to prevent the uh, virus from sweeping through and causing uh, major outbreaks in nursing home and long-term care residents. Next slide, please. Uh, so what helped bring the hospital and the rest of the system into alignment quickly and effectively, and what really defined the ability of the healthcare sector in Juno to respond as uh, effectively as they did early on, was uh, to, to go back to um, Bob's theme, was very effective crisis communication and operational alignment. So, uh, and this spanned every level of government uh, from the state to local to institutional. The uh, weekly updates by uh, the Alaska chief medical officer, Dr. Ann Zink, are uh, something that many people have cited throughout the healthcare system as helping keep uh, them on track and helping uh, kind of communicate in clear language that uh, medical professionals and lay people could all understand and on a regular uh, basis. One of the hallmarks of effective crisis communications in public health is acknowledging the unknowns, uh, acknowledging that we don't have all of the information that we need to, but that we have an organizational and leadership structure that is assessing the situation on a constant basis and making the best possible decisions with available information. And Dr. Zink was able to provide that kind of leadership for the state and set an example. The, um, the system that was used to align different organizations, uh, including government and uh, healthcare and non-government partners was the incident command system. So this is a hierarchical structure uh, that operates under the national uh, security framework uh, and is used by FEMA and other organizations. It basically uh, provides a general template for breaking out functions in a crisis that can be mobilized and then demobilized as an emergent situation unfolds. And it assigns clear responsibilities for public facing communication, for safety within the organization, for operations, planning, logistics, and finances. And uh, it all uh, creates a clear reporting structure that ultimately uh, funnels to the incident commander. So under the unified command uh, under CBJ, the uh, hospital and the Department of Public Health and the city management were aligned in what they were doing by using similar structures. Next slide, please. The uh, healthcare system response in Juneau, uh, which we started tracking in spring and have uh, continued to touch base with the major players throughout this time, uh, we uh, kind of break it into the early phase and the later or more sustained phase, uh, and now going into the winter surge phase. And this largely reflects uh, regional trends. Uh, both in 
uh, Alaska and in other rural or more isolated communities. So in the early phase, the Juno through its early quick action and mobilization was able to essentially seal itself off from an initial influx of cases and prevent a major outbreak early on. This uh, helped preserve the healthcare system from becoming overwhelmed the way uh, that uh, more dense population centers and cities where the virus had had a head start uh, by spring. Uh, so Juno did not experience an early overwhelming surge. Some of the limitations uh, of the system in spring included, and this reflects the national reality at the time, uh, included very limited testing capability. So we're talking about March into April of 2020 when the gold standard molecular diagnostic testing could essentially uh, be done on an extremely limited basis uh, in local department of health labs. Uh, and the uh, majority of people who would be suspected of having COVID-19 would actually not be able to obtain a test. This becomes really important when you are triaging and admitting patients to a hospital, in this case, the only hospital in the area, because you need to be able to identify which patients need to be uh, isolated on protocols that require everyone coming into contact with them to wear high levels of personal protective equipment. Now, Juno went into this with rather limited PPE reserves and limited space uh, equipped for isolating for an airborne pathogen. There was also across the board limited scientific knowledge about this virus, and we shared that wherever we were, uh, as well as a uh, need to shut down selectively some medical services to help preserve staff safely preserve PPE and essentially buy time to understand what uh, everyone was doing. The uh, major challenge in that time was managing fear of the unknown of, of what people were seeing happen in other cities. And this issue of crisis communications uh, as the, uh, the glue that kept it all together. Some of uh, the most effective actions during the early uh, phase included uh, training medical staff for new capabilities and roles to meet a possible surge. Even though that was not needed at the time, it was uh, helpful for everyone to know there was a surge capacity if it were to be needed. So that might, uh, so that uh, included, for example, training people who typically work outside the hospital in clinics or in a community level to refresh on hospital management of sicker patients, a training non-patient facing staff or non-clinical staff, such as medical administrators or uh, nurses that don't work in a clinical capacity to answer patient questions about this virus, to triage and to do uh, some aspects of telemedicine management. And using more telemedicine allowed also to preserve medical staff safely. So as uh, the summer went on and then uh, into fall, there were uh, some uh, features that changed. So the technical capacity uh, improved, although testing remained and remains limited on site. So the issue is there is a limited number of, uh, of rapid tests that can be done and they're usually uh, preserved for hospital centered decisions, but most tests that are not needed for an urgent same day decision need to be shipped out and can take several days to come back. The um, medical information and scientific research on COVID-19 has of course moved at absolutely unprecedented pace. The fact that we have several vaccines uh, coming out this quickly shows what can be accomplished when the entire scientific and biomedical research machinery of the world is tuned to the same channel and uh, working together. Uh, the medical system has been maintaining nearly normal operations. Uh, this may change as the uh, hospital starts to reach capacity and it may change as the hospitals to which one would typically transfer very sick patients out of Barfoot Regional. Uh, so uh, that would be Anchorage and possibly Seattle uh, as they fill up the ability of smaller hospitals that transfer to them kind of backs up. The uh, pandemic fatigue issue is a huge uh, problem across the nation, uh, but it's extremely um, 
uh, acutely felt in smaller communities with more limited reserves of staff. So when people uh, have been following protocols or uh, attempting to communicate precaution measures for months and months and months, it does wear people down. And uh, the issue of medical staff burnout uh, is likely to be mo more problematic as uh, the, this very uh, challenging COVID winter goes on. It is helped by hope for, for a vaccine to be available to protect staff. And it is helped by uh, uh, leadership that can help uh, kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Managing misinformation and competing messages uh, has, has been a challenge. Uh, so both for misinformation that spreads online uh, and kind of the disconnect between people and the medical system sometimes. So in uh, the graph uh, that uh, Jim showed earlier for where people get their information, notably their doctor was not one of the major sources of information, which uh, to, to me was a little disappointing, but knowing how difficult it can be to for people to contact their physicians or their medical offices when operations are disrupted and staff are overwhelmed, it's not entirely surprising. So as uh, Juno faces the fall and uh, now winter surge in cases, uh, these are the areas uh, to which hopefully leadership and alignment and communication can direct to help get the healthcare system through this. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're, yeah, I'm on. <laughs> I think we're are here. What I'd like to go to before I go through these um, is that uh, the next uh, video, um, I think we'll do that now. Yeah, I think that would be good to do if we, if Peggy, you can pull that up and then we'll go to the final thoughts and go to questions. I, I don't think the audio's on. You know, our core values are mm -hmm. open, deliberative, careful, thoughtful, uh, considerate, slow. Um, I've been given emergency powers to just do things absent public process, uh, which I find uh, a little alarming. Uh, and I have worked very hard to not use those emergency powers. Uh, and I've generally forced the assembly to meet uh, and make decisions as an elected body. Uh, I think there's kind of a, an element of uh, democracy um, that really needs to be cared for. Um, one of the strangest things that I did was early on uh, in, I think it must've been March or maybe even early April, I called up the Arts Council uh, and I literally said to Nancy Deterney, our arts director, I said, Nancy, and she's a nonprofit, she doesn't report to me. I said, Nancy, I'm taking over the Arts Council. You have to move out tomorrow. I'm turning it into a homeless shelter. Do you need any moving vans? And do you have any questions? But you have to be out tomorrow. Um, that is not the kind of thing that the city manager normally does. You know, we, we have a lot of people that are uh, extremely high quality employees. I mean, they're, they're state commissioner caliber uh, employees that we have running departments. And, um, so I think it's shown us to be super, super strong. Um, the way we were able to pivot on uh, testing, airport screening, uh, homeless sheltering, public information. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's been impressive. Great. Great to see you next year. I love it. Um, all right. I, I was going to, if we get back to the other slide, uh, just as a summary of kind of early thoughts, and these are very early, I think that we are in the third inning of this pandemic. Uh, so, um, and I got that from one of our assembly members. Um, and uh, 
So these are just some early thoughts. Things that appear to be working, communication strategy, they put a lot of time and effort into it. CBJ, they went from a half position to eight. Transparency seemed to be very good with government. Uh, people didn't complain about, oh, what is the government doing? Uh, integrated leadership, uh, meaning that they um, really used a variety of tools and uh, um, did not um, um, really share the leadership, I thought was really impressive. The enterprise uh, structure of what we own in town and then the testing, I think all that stuff appears to be working. Points for further inquiry, that's what we're going to be working on maybe in addition. Are there gaps in information about underserved populations? Can these structures, the ICS and the, and the Emergency Operations Center, should it be more? There was a, uh, should we improve that in some way? Can it benefit from a more holistic approach? And that's what the city manager brought up. He goes, you know, there's a correlation between if I close the school, what happens at the bars? If I close the bars, what happens to the schools? So we have to come up with maybe a better uh, holistic approach maybe when, it's, when there's crisis. Um, so, and, and uh, communications between the native and non-native efforts, uh, formal communica communications during the emergency response. Can we learn from the decision-making processes used by the assembly? They basically threw out the committee structure when they started meeting and they had to rapidly make decisions and they took risks and it seems like the risks that they took seemed to pan out so far. Um, and is this communication strategy transferable to other communities that they're using at City Hall because it seems to be working? And what are the positive institutional legacies? What do we learn and what are the legacies of this for the next pandemic? Or maybe we become more efficient, like now we're doing telemedicine. Uh, we, we've kind of broken barriers that we would have taken years to do. So there's some good things there. Um, so that's, I think I'll end up with that unless, uh, and go to questions if there are any. Um, let's try to do that, Peggy. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you, Peggy. <laughs> Perseverance, just as a, a commercial, uh, you know, ad here, uh, Perseverance came to us and said, hey, uh, we've got some funds to do some COVID, this and that, and what they're doing is a, uh, uh, a performance, and uh, that's on December 16th at 6 p.m., and they're asking for uh, uh, some help with that and uh, contact them. I, we, we, we just got this this evening, so we just kind of put it into a slide. We didn't have a chance to really um, uh, go over it much. But anyway, um, that will, I think that will be uh, another look at ourselves as far as a performance in a performing arts at the, uh, at the Perseverance Theater, which is just wonderful. So they're getting involved uh, also. Uh, okay, Peggy, go ahead. We've got questions. Well, we don't have any questions. Are there any questions? Can you put them into the chat box? Or if there aren't a lot of them, maybe just, I don't know, uh, or call in if that's possible. Let's try to start with the chat, though, if there are any questions. Oh, can I throw one out? Uh, as the, as the introducer. Um, I just wondered, you know, ultimately this is a case study, right? And you'll, you'll have other case studies to compare it to, but in terms of kind of your point, Jim, adaptive governance, but maybe others can chime in. What, what do you think are uh, the big kind of theoretical conclusions from this case study that either support or maybe diverge from the larger body of adaptive governance theory that we have? Oh boy, you don't start with the easy question. <laughs> do you? Um, uh, well, Dean Thornton, uh, I, uh, that's a good, very good question. Usually what we're trying to do in the literature right now is to define adaptive capacity. And um, that's what comes to my mind. Are we building our capacity locally so when we get hit again by this shock, whatever that shock is, um, and I think that maybe we can get to some better metrics. Uh, we might be able to identify some of those metrics better um, and see where, our, where the cracks in the cement are. I think that that's maybe what we can learn. Adaptive capacity is all about learning, um, learning cycles uh, um, and 
are we learning as we go? They've had to move so fast that um, it's hard to get feedback loops in there. And maybe we haven't, maybe those feedback loops haven't had time to really uh, learn from the feedback loop. So that's, that's what, just some thoughts. Capacity, learning, feedback loops. I think it's, again, we're only in the third inning. Thanks. Well, that appears in this, but I don't see anybody typing. I think that is our question for the evening. Wait, I have a question. Okay. This is Karen. Karen Carey, I'm the chancellor. Hi, Karen, go right ahead. So, as you know, we had a once in a long, long while weather event in the last week that is causing a lot of people with, with a lot of people crises. And, you know, I think in some way, some of your research, research fits into, into that as well. What do you think about that in terms of what's happening in Haines and here in Juneau? I have some thoughts, but I turn it over to the other uh, research professors first. Jim, please share your thoughts. I oh, think oh. the floor is yours, Jim. Okay, um, we, uh, Juno is not, uh, uh, it's not uncommon to have some shocks to our system. Uh, the, the first shock, at least in uh, modern history was the avalanche that uh, hit our community and drove the price of energy up 450% overnight. And the mayor at that time did not invoke the ICS system. This time we did. Uh, and there was a evaluation of that first shock and that was the complaint. I think he did a great job because he grew up here. He had social capital, which he used to put task force together. He knew who to call and everything. Um, so it was effective, but that was a complaint. This time we, we went right to the ICS system. And uh, so that was, that was invoked. Um, so I think that this uh, shock, and it's a strange shock because it's continuing, um, we're learning about those structures. And that's what's a particular of interest of mine, obviously, is do those structures, do the institutions work? Do they fit? Is there institutional fit? And it seems like in this instance, there is, but it's really a case study. And Tom said that, I mean, we're going to be carrying... Uh, comparing to other situations, but we're isolated. Is there something about our isolation, our self-reliance, our history, uh, native and non-native of how we maybe share uh, uh, the populations? All those are at play. And that's why it's a perfect case study because there's such context and uh, texture to it all. I think those are all factors. Can we tease those out? That's what we're trying to do right now. Um, in this first round. I don't know if that answered the question, but some thoughts. Can I ask a question? I can't type on my iPad. <laughs> this Please is do, Maria. Okay, thank you. I was wondering, what's the plans for, you say this is preliminary, and I don't know if that means preliminary analysis of all you've done or you're going to do more. Are you going to do more surveys? Are you going to do them in a year? Just, I, I missed the beginning of the talk, so I'm not sure if you said that, thanks. Thanks, Maria. Um, and Maria, if I may say, she's the one that gave me the third inning analogy. Um, she's on our assembly uh, decision maker. Um, yeah, um, I think we're still going to do some follow up interviews. Um, it's an it's a year grant. We're giving we're not giving a lot of uh, money to do it, but I think that's in the future as well as the public survey that's still out there. So we're still getting data from the public convenience survey, and we'll probably go back to uh, certain individuals that we interviewed to see what changed over time. Uh, so we're, we're still preliminary. Uh, we haven't done our analysis of all of our data. These are just really uh, preliminary thoughts. Thank you, because like I did say, um, no one's going to say, boy, Juno did good for the first five months. It's going to be for the whole event. And I just wanted to, I'm glad you're still at it. Thanks. 
Thank you, Maria. Is there anyone else who would like to unmute and ask a question? All right, I'm sending it back to you, Jim. Yeah, there's some questions I see that are coming up. Ron Hines, who's uh, Dr. Ron Hines, who's at and, and collaborated with us. We collaborated with at least, oh, four different organizations because people are doing surveys a lot on, uh, in our community. And I didn't want to duplicate, I wanted to uh, collaborate. And we did, we were successful. And thanks to Ron Hines and to uh, Lisa Bush at the uh, Sitka Sound Science Center. Ron has a question. I understand that the city purchased an instrument for testing. Is the instrument operating? I don't think we received it yet. Uh, we did, I know the city allocated, uh, I think it was 700,000 and maybe Maria might have an answer for this. You're right, Jim, it was something like 700,000 and it's not operating yet, no. Okay. Um, this is Hannah. M my understanding was that there are a couple different systems and one of them, the Cepheid has been in use uh, at the hospital lab for some time, but its capacity is quite limited to, because of uh, the nature of the cartridges that have to go into it that are back ordered across the nation as every state is facing a surge at the same time. And the city, uh, and uh, Maria, please correct me, the city has purchased a machine that would allow for much greater testing capacity on site without sending the, the tests out uh, for the process that currently can take a, a couple of days. Uh, and when that is fully operational, the time it takes to tell someone if they should be isolating or if it's, uh, or the time it takes to trace a potential outbreak uh, will be much reduced. Great. Okay, yeah. we have another one from Luann McVie Bay. Um, it's, it's actually Vivian Mork. It's Vivian Mork. Yes, it is. It's, okay. She's using Luann's. Um, oh, okay. Well, Vivian. Um, she says the uh, pandemic isn't over. What are the city's plans for continuing COVID protection measures in the months to come? It, it, it's hard for me to answer that. I don't work for the city. Um, if the, Maria, if you don't want, mind uh, fielding that question, maybe. Sure. Uh, it's obviously correct. It's not over. We're still in the game. Uh, we're monitoring what happens at the EOC. We get daily reports from uh, all of our numbers um, and uh, it's not over. So we're still following it and we're gonna do the same thing we did from the beginning, which is uh, listen to what's going on and, and act accordingly. We, the assembly uh, got together and with the emergency operations center and developed a matrix when x happens you do y so because we were meeting so much and uh it's hard for a body of nine to respond in that way and so we passed a uh, adopted a a plan for what would happen if we had this level of virus in the community and that's what's been happening the eoc has been following that and it all of those data are up on the city's website and including that matrix and um yeah, we're not we're not done. We're still on it. Thank you, Maria, for um, for jumping in and grabbing that question for us. And we have another question from Robert Sewell uh, regarding your research method. What would you add to your approach? Do you have any hopes for your methods going forwards? Good, good question from Dr. Sewell. Uh, I'm going to turn that to maybe uh, to Joe. Do you see any uh, uh, different ways of, or it's additional, there are, there are going to be additional um, interviews, I would say, in-depth interviews for follow-ups. Um, in addition to that, um, I turn it to the other uh, researchers, if they have any thoughts. I, that's a great question. Um, Given that it was a rapid response grant, you know, you, 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 you put these things together using the best methods on the fly. And so, um, you know, the team really kind of pulled together a lot in a short amount of time. But the importance of the question, I think, that's being asked isn't looking at 
the current approach, but rather how would we continue this approach in the future, given a little more time for planning. And I would argue that in a deliberative decision-making setting, so some sort of deliberative valuation or decision-making exercise, where you can take the interviewees, given that they are decision-makers and planners, and start anticipating and thinking about how things are gonna change. That's the type of research question we need to start focusing on is preparing uh, for those changes coming down the road. So deliberate decision-making uh, approaches I think would be of, of great value in future research efforts. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, that's all I had. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, I was just gonna say, um, I was thinking that there might be two additional research methods that we could use that we haven't really used so far. One would be something like focus groups where we have a small, we've, we've been doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews, but it might be interesting to bring together a group of people, eight to 10 people who've been living through the various uh, phases of the, of the pandemic and get them to discuss that in, in a little more detail and go into some of the areas. The other thing I think would be interesting that we haven't been able to pursue yet is following up on this communications issue and looking at how, trying to understand the social networks of how people exchange information, you know, who exactly they're talking to. They, get, they might get information from the media, from newspapers, from the online websites of newspapers, that kind of thing. Um, but then really get some more data on, on how they evaluate the news they get from the authorities and from, you know, sort of official sources, and then who they talk to to discuss that and, you know, where their level of trust is really, who do they trust uh, among the information sources and, and how do they make those evaluations. I think, you know, Juno seems to be a relatively, uh, obviously there's, you know, the whole country now seems to be quite polarized across a number of different dimensions. Um, I think some of the, the cities, you know, like certainly where I am in, in Northern Virginia, it's, it's quite homogeneous, I would say, <laughs> in, our, in our approach to COVID, but it's not true if you go a little bit farther south from here. Um, it seems like you probably have that rural urban divide in Alaska as well, but you know, just trying to understand where people uh, put their trust these days and, and, and what kind of social links are existing between those different groups. I'll just add on to that. I know we have some other questions, it seems like coming in, but um, if uh, uh, the avalanche is any indicator, there was a city um, request to do an assessment of how we responded to that. And there was a task force put together. So we might be interested in, in participating in something like that. Okay, how do we do uh, kind of uh, questions? after assuming this ends someday and, and we get a chance to do that, doing an assessment of some sort. But I think the focus groups things is uh, something we haven't done yet. It would be really good. And I, I want to point out that um, we had a lot of interviews and a lot of data and we had to pick and choose tonight to, uh, because there's, there's a, and, um, uh, but by all means, uh, um, you know, the, the suggestions that are coming into the chat, uh, those are really good suggestions. And um, I see one that if you could expand the scope to the school board since they make many decisions, um, you know, we'd love to take, you know, any kind of suggestions like that, you know, we're, we're welcome to that idea to, uh, to, um, to consider. Okay, the next one um, is from Kelsey Aho. Um, do you have any findings relevant to folks in transition, such as those in their late 20s or their 20s, and how to contribute to their adaptive capacity? Uh, just a simple answer, no. Uh, I, I don't think uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we do have some data on age groups, uh, thanking uh, Lisa Bush and the folks at the Sitka Sound Science Center. Uh, so we do have some demographics on some um, attitudinal information, but from there we would, you know, we'd look at that information. Okay, and then here is the next one from Julie Nielsen. 
How does Juno's approach compare to other cities that have also done a good job meeting these challenges? Is there a common thread? Um, then she includes a link from the Robert, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which has followed several communities and explores this. I, I hope we do that. That would be the next step after we do more uh, intensive analysis of the data that we have is then maybe looking at other cities. Yeah, but I would think the communications piece is key there. I mean, <laughs> not only because I was working on it, but I think that that that's you know it touches the health the healthcare aspect of it. It touches the governance. Um, maybe it gives a sense of more confidence in the economy, perhaps, if people know. Uh, you know, there's a, a clear sense of what's going on. I think that you know, and so different parts of the country might have different kind of messages coming in and. Who they, who they trust, that sort of thing. But if there's a clear, con consistent message, I think that's gonna be important. Great questions. Okay, oh, we've got another one from uh, Steve Colt. Mm -hmm. Following up on Kelsey's question, did you learn anything about people who may have actually left the area, perhaps temporarily, and thus were probably not included in your sample? Not yet, not that I know of. Great question. Okay, well then we have reached the end of our questions. Great, um, maybe it's time to close up. Um, I'll do a quick thing and then maybe Tom wants to say a few words, I'm not sure. Um, but as you see up on the board, we're advertising the, the attitudinal um, survey. Uh, that Sixth Sound Science Center put out, and they and they joined hands with uh, the Rand Corporation too. I think put that out, and they allowed us to put some questions in it, which was great. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, and if you have any questions, you can call me. And then there is the city uh, testing uh, the number, and also their uh, web link uh, for information. And thanks again to the research team. Uh, it's been, uh, I just take this opportunity to say it's been great working with all you guys. And I look forward to uh, finishing up the project for sure. And everyone that joined us this evening, thank you very much. Tom, do you want to end with any words or? Nope, just say thanks to all for uh, the wonderful presentation. Very timely uh, as our cases are rising. Uh, and thank you all for attending even an evening at Egan this fall. I think it's been a very successful series and it's maybe an example of adaptive governance. <laughs> we were able to take it online and still keep informative talks going. So thanks to everyone and good night. Thank you. Good night.